Hello and welcome to Ask Me Anything, a series from Security Magazine where security leaders answer your questions about the industry, from best practices for risk management to the ins and outs of their position. I'm your host, Madeline Lover, Assistant Editor of Security Magazine. Today, I'm joined by Mary Gates, President at Security and Safety Consultancy, GMR 410. Mary has held many high-level security roles throughout her career, including Executive Director of Global Security and Investigations at J.P. Morgan Chase, leading physical security and business and program management efforts at the organization. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Madeline. It's very nice to join you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit with you and your listeners. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Uh, readers across our social media have submitted their questions for you today, so let's get started. Yeah. Excellent. The first question that we received is, how did you enter the security field? <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of an interesting story. I had no interest in security whatsoever. I was working through a management rotation a long time ago, uh, as you can tell by the gray hair, and um, was was actually working towards finance. And my plan was to go into financial management. Um, but through my management rotation, I received a call and they said, hey, we want you to go spend time working with our security officer. I kind of scratched my head for a little bit and, and thought, you mean you want me to go be a guard? I'm like, I'm not, I'm not equipped to go be a guard. And they kind of laughed and they said, no, 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 we don't want you to be a guard. We want you to go spend some time working in security. Just, you know, get to know the, the security director, spend some time in there, kind of learn and understand what the security organization is about. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll be happy to go do that. This was with back, you know, way back in the day um, with what uh, at that time was a very small uh, financial institution specific to Louisiana. So I did that and absolutely fell in love with security. It was, I found it to be so interesting and just really enjoyed the opportunity to learn something that I had absolutely no insight to prior to that time. So at the end of that rotation, by the time I was, was moving out and moving into something else, I was actually moving into the audit department at that time, which is what I thought I was interested in. Um, I, I walked out of the door and I turned around and I looked at the security director and I said, if you ever have an opening, let me know because I would like to apply. And sure enough, about a year later, I received a call saying, are you still interested I'd love to have you come back. And it just kind of grew from there. I, I ended up applying, moving into uh, his department and really starting to learn from the ground floor. So entered it as a, as a base level position, learned from him. He took me under his wing, became, you know, he was my mentor. Um, and once I decided that I really wanted to make a career out of it, that's, of course, when I started learning more about it, attending um, classes, you know, actually going back to school and really embracing a full understanding of what security is and, and what did I need to know in order to be a, an effective security person. So it took a little while to get there, um, but, but once I, I really found the, the joy in security, I knew that that's, that was where I needed to be. That was my home. Yeah, I find that it can be such an experiential field to grow into that starting from the ground up and really understanding each of those roles, I'm sure has played a huge role in both your executive work, but also your consultancy career too. It really, you know, it really truly does. And I think that's what was so exciting about this was because I came in with no preconceived notions about this. I really learned from the people around me. Hmm. And, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't come into it with any type of a bias. I didn't really understand anything about security. I was a numbers person. I was a business person. And so I had all of those facts and I had all of those fi figures and everything was black and white. And now kind of looking at it through a security and safety lens, I was like, wow, you know, I never really looked at it from that point of view. And 
understanding that what these things do affects people and how we look at risk affects people. Um, and, and once I realized that, I was like, this, this is where I need to be because I know that what I'm doing is impactful, not just to the company's bottom line, but to the people who actually make up the company. That makes a lot of sense. We had a more strategic question come in, um, and it's what are some of the biggest operational inefficiencies you see across enterprises in terms of security? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. I think the first is, and I see this more so now in a consultancy role, um, because, you know, we work with with a lot of clients who come in, and they're like, you know, help, help look at look at our security programs and a common theme that that I see when I go in there is. Have you really and clearly and articulately defined what your mission is? Have you defined what your core functions are? Have you standardized your objectives? And if you've done that, if you think you've done that, have you communicated that across your business, not only internally to your business unit, but outwardly to your key stakeholders? And a lot of times what you find is there's a disconnect that even people within your own organization, within your own business units may not understand truly what it is that they're supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be delivering those services. So there's a disconnect between teams across corporate security and how they deliver services and the services that they deliver. So I think that's that's one problem that, that I see pretty much across the, the security field. I think the second would be, have you really diagnosed your current posture? Are the services you're delivering effective for your organization? Are you even measuring the services that you're delivering so that you can make informed decisions around those services and communicate the value that you're bringing to your organization? Because if you can't measure it, then are you sure that you should be doing it? And why are you doing it if you can't communicate the value of it to the organization? I think the third thing is a reluctancy to admit that you're not the smartest person in the room and, <laughs> and you want to hold on to everything and not necessarily outsource. There's the, the, the problem with security is no one really appreciates security until something happens. And then everybody loves security. Everybody starts throwing money at security. Um, and when that happens, we sometimes get sidetracked by looking at the bright, shiny objects because now we have money to spend. If you're really effective, and this goes back to points one and two, if you're really effective in your programmatic approach to security, then considering outsourcing, I think, is more effective for you. And I'm not saying outsource everything, but there are certain things that you can outsource because it frees up your time to be more effective in the more critical roles like liaisoning with law enforcement, doing penetration testing, um, you know, working with your, uh, your internal stakeholders, being prepared for crisis management. You know, there's so much that's happening in the world today. You need to be more proactive as opposed to, to reactive. So doing things like outsourcing risk assessments, risk, uh, you know, security reviews, your, your TEVRAs, um, you know, bringing in subject matter experts, either on a short-term or a long-term basis, um, those types of things um, will help you become more successful in the long run, rather than you just saying, I have to do it all myself, or my team has to do it all ourselves, which can sometimes be to your detriment. So I think to me, that's, that's kind of like the top three um, that I would, that I would immediately think of. 
Definitely. And you talked about diagnosing security posture and you also mentioned risk assessments. And we had a couple of questions about that, okay. about the proper way to conduct a risk assessment. When mm -hmm. should you do it? And should it be a continuous process? How often? That kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Risk assessments absolutely should be a critical component of any corporate security program. The risk assessment should be a continuous process. It's not a one and done thing. And what I think is really interesting is in speaking to, you know, not every, but 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 some companies, people think, oh, I've done my risk assessment, I'm finished. I'm like, no, time out. <laughs> you know, this is something you need to do, not just because you've created this new facility. This is something you need to continuously do. And what is your program? Well, then you find out they, they've never created a program. So a, a holistic security program really looks at everything around risk. Risks should be looked at the organizational level, not just at you know, this one little piece. And I think it's really important when you start thinking about risk is, are you measuring risk at the enterprise level? And if you're not doing that, if you're not bringing in your key stakeholders to be part of the process, that's a key component that you're missing in the risk assessment program. So then I think the number one thing to, to really think about when you start talking about risk assessment is, Number one, do you have a program? Because it should be a programmatic approach. Um, and if not, then you should think about building one. Number two, are you doing it in a vacuum? Because risk assessments cannot be siloed. Um, you should be bringing in your key stakeholders because if you don't know the business, you can't really assess the risk of the the business that you're that you're there looking at. So let's say for example it is a financial institution and you're looking at the risk around data centers or the risk around branches or the risk around you know off-premise ATMs or the risk of a mortgage center. A security person may not know all of the or all of the operations at those particular facilities. So it's important that you engage with those key leaders to understand what's happening at those facilities and the types of things that are going on with their employees at those sites. Are they having any type of layoffs that might be coming up? Are they having any type of incidents um, that may be impacting threats that are coming into those locations so that you can make those um, informed and take that informed information in order to factor into the risk assessment. So I think you know, doing something in a silo is never going to work around a risk assessment process either. So I think that's, you know, that's something to consider as well. And then I think finally, there should be something that ties back to incidents. There should be an incident driven process as well, um, where the security professional looks at locations after an incident occurs, whether it's employee related, whether it's customer related, whether there's a workplace violence incident, um, there's just any type of an incident that, that occurs that may change the security rating profile. Uh, it may not, but it's at least something that would require um, a security professional to go in and take a look and see um, if, if uh, security measures should be enhanced uh, based on the incident. Going off of that, we had a question about security budget. Are there specific strategies you've used in the past to kind of increase that leadership buy-in, increase security budgets where needed? The, I think the top thing I would say is you have to really do your homework. Um, you need to really look at beyond the day-to-day -day and what what you really need to do in order to justify your organization and how you can create not only have your budget but create an effective budget you know you have to be able to communicate the value that security brings to the organization and you, you do that by having meaningful metrics. And you have to be able to demonstrate, number one, that you're part of the infosphere of the organization. 
you have to be talking in common business terms. You have to be able to communicate with other key business leaders across your organization, whatever it may be, whether it's in automotive, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in finance, whatever it may be, you need to be able to communicate with them on a common platform. And then you need to communicate how what you're doing is beneficial to them. And because they don't want to view you as just a cost center. And a lot of times that's how people think of security is as a cost center. And it's not. You should be a critical business partner within the organization. So if you have those meaningful metrics, if you have the ability to tell the story of security, the, I think number one, that goes a long way. I think number two, if you've built out that risk assessment program, like we talked about a few minutes ago, and you've been able to assimilate data elements, that goes a long way to help support the value that you're bringing to the organization. So building that robust security program and having risk assessments as part of that program helps show, helps to demonstrate, here's what I'm doing to help keep you safe. I think doing things like that will, will help um, uh, people get, get additional budgets. A couple things that you brought up connect really well to another question that we received about building a program proving that security can be a value add. Um, and this question was, how can security leaders develop and use multifunctional teams to kind of force mm -hmm. multiply their reach across an organization? Mm -hmm. Well, security absolutely cannot exist in a silo. I mean, if you if you really think about it, one of the one of the things I think security leaders say quite often is security is everyone's responsibility and which is really true it's a it's absolutely a true statement and it's important for a security program to be successful you need to bring in additional stakeholders in order to have the security program be successful the security program has to work from the top down if you don't have support at the top the people who are, are the employees in the organization are not going to support it. They're not going to follow the directions. They're not going to do the things they're supposed to do. But if there is support down and then from bottom up, then everyone across the organization is going to buy into the security program. You work with people within your organization who are key leaders in their field, in their business unit, to come in and give you information. And that helps you have the knowledge that you need to be more successful. I couldn't make a decision about how to best protect a, uh, an office building without understanding what was happening in that office building. You know, I needed to know how do people get into the location? How do, um, um, you know, what happens in that location? What, what does real estate need in order to be able to do their day-to-day -day operations? What does XYZ company need to do? What do the tenants need to do? How do they need to move in and out um, without being able to understand what those things are? So I think really having folks from real estate be your, be your key business partner, having folks from uh, legal being able to guide you effectively, having human resources help you build up your future leaders and work with you to help identify who, the, who those future leaders are um, and to help you implement a succession program. Um, all of those things work together to make you more cohesive, make you more successful um, and, and make you have a better program moving into the future. Definitely. Those, the, that idea of specialists and partnering across your organization, I think, really speaks to the idea that security isn't a monolith. And to be mm -hmm. more successful, you really need to have buy-in from other departments, but also show that you're willing to partner and get that information. Right. And I think, too, it's not just internally. You know, it, I think it's really important to, to reach out outward and, and really have conversations with your peers and what that does is it kind of helps you benchmark where you are in the industry. 
and and you can find out oh my gosh you know I didn't even think about something like that kind of going back to what we talked about not being the smartest person in the room um there's a there's a lot in in my you know 30 years that I've learned from from just picking up the phone and and calling you know somebody I know at another at another business or another financial institution or or whatever the case may be um just by saying hey here's a problem I have and you know here's some here's something I'm running into do you have you had the hat you know ever had the same kind of issue who did you talk to what what was your experience um and just really having that network of people um I, I, I think goes a long way to really help you figure out the the best way to to approach either best practices um, or solve problems, especially on, on the fly. And it's not only just that network of, of other subject matter experts, but it's also law enforcement, um, it's first responders, it's just really building up a group of people around you um, that you feel comfortable having that dialogue with um, and really, really engaging with in order to to make you the best that you can be and make your team the best that they can be and make your organization the best that it can be. Well, we have one more question today. What leadership skills have you found most helpful in high level corporate security roles throughout your career? If I had to put into like a couple of just different soft skills, I would say number one, of course, would be integrity. When you say integrity, I think a lot of people, they just kind of think of that's truthfulness and honesty, but really in, in most cases, it also really means that you have and you stand by a real strong set of values. You know, having integrity in the workplace, at least to me, it means that you're able to make ethical choices um, and you really help the companies that you work for maintain a positive image. So I think number one, just integrity, that's that's a strong leadership skill that mm-hmm. um, I think is is really important. I think two, decisiveness would be a leadership strength that um, uh, a good strong leader really needs to have. You know, I think it's really important that an effective leader, makes decisions quickly with the information that they have, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, I think effective deci- decision-making really comes with time and experience. Um, I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to make a decision when you don't have all of the necessary information, um, but decisiveness can really help move projects along more quickly um, and it really helps improve efficiency. And I think effectiveness, effective decisiveness really, really requires a lot of research. Um, so you have to be strong in, in understanding you know, your research skills. You have to really have some good problem solving skills and goal setting. Um, and you have to be able to make quick turnarounds. So I think anybody who's a decision maker has to be able to pull from their own experience um, evaluate whatever they think might work best, and then make decisions confidently, um, and then take responsibility for the results. So uh, decisiveness would would have to be a strong one as well. And then I think a third would be relationship building. Um, you have to surround yourself with really strong people. Um, you have to maintain a really good collaborative team of people. And you all have to be working towards the same goal. So this, you know, in order to do that, I think you got to have, you know, really strong communication skills. Um, you have, you absolutely have to be able to resolve conflict. Um, and it's just really important that you're communicating the the tasks effectively, um, your goals efficiently and effectively. And then I think once once the team um, and you understand each other, um, you can really benefit then by assessing your your strengths. You can delegate tasks appropriately, and then you can you know complete your goals more seamlessly. So um, I really think 
those go a long way in, in making for effective leaders. Well, thank you so much for going into all that. That is all the time that we have today, but thank you so much for joining us, Mary. Well, thank you so much. It was great meeting you and, and talking with you, and um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for listening to Ask Me Anything from Security Magazine. Remember to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter for the chance to have your questions answered in a future conversation. Listen to or watch more of the Ask Me Anything series on LinkedIn Live, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or directly from our site, securitymagazine.com. See you soon!